अब इसको तो सही जाते हैं Okay, so good morning and good afternoon to everyone. So we're gonna have the the qualification of João Gabriel. He's uh, supervised by Mark Casals, and um, I would like to to really thank Alison Fabri to 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 be here and to to uh, also um, uh, check his work and and give contributions. So João, uh, he's going to to make a qualification. The, the title is correlation in Schwarzschild black hole space time. And uh, so go ahead, John, feel free to, to start. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Oh, can you can you see my screen? Maybe even too much? Yes. yes, I do. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. As Felipe pointed, my name is Joel, and I'm working under supervision of Professor Mark Casals. And today I'm presenting my PhD qualification. And the title is uh, Correlations in, in Schwarzschild Space-Time. I will begin by making a short introduction where I give some motivation for why I'm studying what I'm studying. So it all began when I, when I started to study the black hole information loss puzzle. So just to be clear, we are not studying the puzzle here, not trying to solve anything. It's just the, my first contact with the area. So in short, the black hole information loss puzzle is a theoretical prediction where a quantum field on a black hole space-time is predicted to evolve from a vacuum state in the asymptotic past to a mixed state in the asymptotic future, specifically a thermal state. And such a thing uh, means that the field undergoes a non-unitary evolution. And this is a puzzle because, in principle, there is nothing outside the, our universe. So the universe should be a closed system and the evolution should be unitary. So this is why we call this situation a puzzle. Now, while studying the information loss puzzle, I obviously faced the phenomena of Hawking radiation. So as pointed, the quantum field evolves into a thermal state in the future, meaning that uh, in the future, we can understand it as being full of thermal radiation. Uh, that thermal radiation is called Hawking radiation. And we understand it as the radiation that is produced by the presence of a black hole. Now, <clears throat> if a black hole produces or induces the production of radiation, then we wanted to understand where does it come from in the sense that we wanna know if the radiation is produced on the horizon, maybe near the horizon or far away from the horizon, where is the radiation actually coming from? We want to understand that better now, that question might not even have a very, uh, a very well-defined answer, but we are interested in trying to understand it. Now, on top of that question, there is the question of, are particle and partner correlated? So the black hole is producing Hawking radiation, but that radiation in principle is produced in pairs. So somewhere, a pair of modes, one mode is outgoing to infinity and another mode is infalling down to the horizon. And that, that those modes are produced in pairs. So in principle, they are correlated. Then that correlation might leave some kind of fingerprint on the, on the vacuum state of the quantum field. So, that, so if, if the quantum state has, the, has that fingerprint of correlations, how they are distributed throughout the space time? So this is uh, the, a more central question to what we are studying. And it relates to the question of where is Hawking radiation produced? Because if we can understand the, the fingerprint that is left by correlations on space-time, we might be able to figure out, well, where there are more correlations, where there are less correlations, and maybe where are those pairs being produced? My presentation is going on automatically. <laughs> I don't know why. Now. Okay, we have that fingerprint that is left by the by, by the by the correlations in the in the vacuum state, and the question now is: Okay, there is this situation. Suppose that I'm going to make some measurement on the on, on a quantum system that can interact with that background field. Given that this background field has a lot of correlations, can those correlations interfere with some measurement that is being done uh, in another experiment? If so, how strong is the effect uh, of these correlations on other measurements? 
And is this effect, is this interference limited to a region of space-time near maybe where the experiment is being done? Is it limited to the to experiments that is that is that are done around the horizon? So we want to understand these issues. So this is the main motivation for uh, our research. Now I'll begin with the more technical stuff. So I, I have to, despite being quite standard, I have to introduce to you the quantum field. So we are going to use geometrized units throughout where the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the Newton Planck's constant and the Boltzmann constants are all set to be dimensionless. We are working in the semi-classical approach. So no back reaction is being considered here. We have a fixed background and our choice was to use a Schwarzschild space-time. We choose Schwarzschild because it is closer to a real, it's closer to what a real black hole should be uh, in maybe an astrophysical setup. Uh, and also we are working in the full 3 plus 1, 3 plus 1 D Schwarzschild space-time. It's important to enforce that. On the right, you can see the standard Penrose diagram for the Schwarzschild space-time. And on the left, we present the metric, which should not be new to you. It's just to, to make clear how we are writing the quantities, what uh, variables we are using for uh, what quantity, and so on. I kindly ask you to keep an eye on this f of r quantity. It's quite standard, but it will appear uh, some uh, many times after during the presentation. Now, before continuing, as a small warning, we are not going to use the left wedge or this uh, square region. Okay, I tried to use the laser pointer, but can you see my mouse? Yes, we can. Do. Okay, yeah, we are yeah, not yeah. going I to do. use this left wedge of the Schwarzschild space-time, and we are also not using the white hole region. So everything happens in this region here on the right. Okay, so no points are being, I mean, nothing is happening on, on, on the left wedge nor the white hole region. So we are not using them. Now on that space-time, we consider a quantum field phi, which is a massless scalar field obeying the klein gordon equation. And we we make the we, we write the field as follows. So in terms of its modes and the annihilation operators, and as is standard, and HC here is for Hamiltonian conjugate. Now you see that there is a summation happening over an index lambda, and that lambda is a suitable set of modes which defines what quantum state we are going to study. I will, I will say a bit more about it later. So in order to actually use the formalism, we have to define an inner product for the solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. And we use the standard Klein-Gordon inner product, which is presented here. It's this expression. And we impose the canonical commutation relations on the creation and annihilation operators, as is standard. And the resulting vacuum state is defined as the quantum state that is annihilated by the annihilation operators. Now, I have talked about the field mode. So what are the field modes? So what are those phi's that we are working with? So the solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation, this phi lambda LMW, they are written as this, exploiting the spherical symmetry of, Schwarz, of the Schwarzschild space-time. So we can decompose them in spherical harmonics. So the important bit here, what we are actually evaluating is this R function. This is what we are working to evaluate, working quite hard actually. And this R obeys uh, a Schrodinger-like equation, you can see here, where the effective potential is given by this expression. Now, if you want to evaluate solutions to that equation, we have to impose some boundary conditions. And now I'm presenting what solutions, what boundary conditions we imposed in order to evaluate the solutions. The first solution is the so-called in solution, which has those asymptotic boundary conditions. And to evaluate it, we use the Jaffe series, which is basically a series expansion with an improved convergence radius for that equation. We also had to evaluate the so-called up solutions, which are defined by these boundary these asymptotic boundary conditions. And to evaluate them, we use the MSD method as implemented in the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit, uh, a package that can be downloaded for Mathematica. For the inside modes, for the modes that have support inside the horizon, we evaluated uh, using this asymptotic boundary condition. 
And for this latch solution, we use the usual series expansion method. So the Fabrinius uh, expansion. And also in the in and up solutions, you can see some, some different things, some, well, non-usual things here. This capital T and this row in and this row up, they are the so-called scattering amplitudes. And we also have to evaluate them in order to get a complete solution. And to evaluate them, the MST method was used by Mark and his former student, Claudia, in the publication that they, they have done in 2018. So they have evaluated these amplitudes using the MST method. And in my work, we are not evaluating them again. We are using the, the data from this publication. Another thing that I have to introduce is the Whiteman function. And for a quantum field phi in some quantum state psi, it's defined as follows. So it's basically the field's two-point function. And, it, and for the quantum states we are considering, it carries all information about the correlation that, is, that exists in the field. So it can, describe, it can describe all correlations that the field have. However, despite having this quite general form, when X is close enough to X prime, or when X is new connected to X prime, we can write the Whiteman function using the so-called Hadamard form, which looks as this. Now here we see this U and V, those are just state independent real valued B scalars. They are completely defined by the geometry of the space time. And this W you can see here is a state dependent real valued B scalar. So what is interesting about the Hadamard form is that we can clearly see what are the singularities of the Whiteman function. So you can see that we do have a PV singularity in the real part of the Whiteman function, and we do have a delta singularity in the imaginary part of the Whiteman function. However, there is one more thing that, the, that this expression tells us. So the real part of the Whiteman function, this contribution, is state dependent because it carries the dependence on W, which is the state dependent uh, V scalar, while the imaginary part is a state independent. So independently of the quantum state we choose, the imaginary part of the Whiteman function, as presented here, will be independent of it. It, it will be the same. So we can say that the real part of the Whiteman is a state dependent, and it's also proportional to the field anti-commutator while the imaginary part, which is a state independent, is proportional to the field commutator. So the commutator is a state independent, while the anti-commutator is a state dependent. This will be very relevant later in, the, in, the, in my work. Now, to evaluate the Whiteman function, we have to come up with some expression that we can actually evaluate. Uh, well, uh, we wish that it could be evaluated analytically, but well, we, we don't know how to do that. So we, we evaluate it numerically using this mode sum expression. And here you see these G functions. They are the modes, the, the Whiteman function modes we are going to use to evaluate the Whiteman function. And those G modes are defined down here as follows. So this super index B, U, and H they indicate what quantum state we are considering. So if, if we want to evaluate the Whiteman function for the Bower state, we are going to use the GB modes, for the Unruh state, the GU modes, and for the Hartle-Hawking state, the GH modes. Now, in these modes, you see an expression here, uh, a, a new term, R bar, and this R bar is just the R solutions that, we, that I presented earlier, but divided by the radius. This is just to make the notation easier. Now, as a very brief introduction, the Bower state can be understood as the quantum state where we have, uh, where we have an, a vacuum in the asymptotic past and vacuum in the asymptotic future. The Unruh state is a quantum state where we have a vacuum in the asymptotic past and a thermal state in the asymptotic future. And the Hartle-Hawking state is a quantum state where we have a, a thermal state in both the past asymptotic past and asymptotic future. So where have we actually evaluated the, the R solutions? So we, for each, we evaluated the field modes with frequencies ranging from 10 to minus three up to 10 in steps of 10 to minus three to get a good resolution. And these L's were evaluated ranging from zero up to 100 in steps of one because this L is an integer number. 
Now, where exactly, what radial position have we chosen to evaluate uh, each of the solutions? For the up and in solutions, we evaluated them from the tortoise coordinate R star, ranging from minus four up to 13 in steps of 0 0.2. And this is, this is roughly equivalent to evaluating the solutions uh, at radiuses that ranges from 2.09 masses of the black hole up to 10.18 masses of the black hole. The inside solutions were evaluated with the tortoise coordinate, now the inside tortoise coordinate, ranging from minus 14 up to minus 0 0.2 in steps of 0 0.2. And this is roughly equivalent to evaluating the solutions inside the horizon from 0 0.77 black hole masses up to 1.999 black hole masses. And we have done all that targeting 16 digits of precision. Now I'm going to now I'm going to talk about my our first work that is uh, as a, if I might say. So we are going to study entanglement harvesting near Schwarzschild black holes. So the motivation for this work is that the ground state of uh, of a massless scalar field, so of a Klein Gordon field, has built-in correlations. That is, the vacuum state of a quantum field that obeys the Klein Gordon equation has correlations built into it, including entanglement. So the question we, we make is if can two unentangled systems become entangled by interacting with that field? And this question is posed in the sense that the two uh, quantum systems, they interact with the field, but for a, an amount of time that is short enough so that they can't communicate with each other. This is the, uh, the setting where we ask that we answer that question. If this can happen, then under what conditions can this happen and how strong is the resulting entanglement that we get? Well, that idea of getting entangled uh, of, of two space-like separated uh, systems getting entangled by interacting with a third system already exists, and it is known as entanglement harvesting. And I'm going to introduce that right now. So to, to introduce harvesting, consider that we have some arbitrary clock that is measuring some, some succession of things happening. So before anything, we have two quantum systems, A and B, which have both, which have each a single degree of freedom. And we have a quantum system, C, that has many degrees of freedom that are, that are initially entangled, uh, as represented by the green lines. <laughs> now we let systems A and B interact with system C for a couple of time, and then they don't interact with system C anymore. However, notice that in principle, system C, the, the correlations that exist as existed in system C are now different. And A and B developed correlations. And these correlations, they have, they have two sources, basically. The green line here represents entanglement in between A and B that was acquired by stealing entanglement from the from the systems from system C degrees of freedom, while the blue line represents entanglement that is acquired by A communicating with system B through system C. That is, if A interact with system C for enough time, the signal of its interaction can reach system B because system B is also interacting with system C and so on. So they can communicate with one another and that would result in entanglement represented by the blue line, but they can also steal entanglement from system C, which is represented by this green line. And this is an illustration. So do not, do, do not, do not take this illustration too seriously. Now, in summary, A and B end up entanglement and end up entangled due to two contributions, one coming from communication and another coming from acquiring entanglement from the field. The first one, the communication contribution is the usual way of getting entangled. And the second one, by stealing correlations from system C, is the harvesting way of getting entanglement. So this is entanglement harvesting, is the, the situation where the two systems kind of steal and the existing entanglement from another system by interacting with it. Now, entanglement is not this entanglement does not imply entanglement harvesting. That is, it's not trivial to tell if Jesus, my presentation is going on by itself. It's not trivial to tell if we have entanglement, entanglement harvesting happening or if we have entanglement mediated by communication happening. So how can we tell the difference? Well, for causally disconnected systems, it's trivial because causally disconnected systems can't directly interact or can't communicate with one another by definition. 
So let's focus on the more tricky, on the trickier case of causally connected systems. For these systems, we can use the Whiteman function. And remember the imaginary part of the Whiteman function, which is proportional to the commutator is a state independent, while the real part proportional to the anti-commutator is a state dependent. Now, this state independent part can be shown to not contribute to harvesting. While the state dependent part can be shown that not all of its contributions can be attributed to communication. However, to lead in order in coupling, coupling in between the field and the, inter the systems that are, in that, are, that are interacting with it, one can show that to lead in order, the contribution to the commutator is a contribution to harvesting, only to leading order. Then to tell if it's harvesting a communication, we have to take a look at the dominant contribution. So if, the, if entanglement is dominated by contributions coming from the commutator, we do, we do not have harvesting. If the entanglement is dominated by contributions coming from the anti-commutator to leading order in coupling, we do have, har we do have harvesting. So the dominant contribution to entanglement tells if we have harvesting or communication. Now, our question is the following. We know that in flat space-time, when two, when two particle detectors are connected by a new geodesic, then any entanglement that uh, results in between them was, is acquired through communication in between them and not through, har and not through harvesting. We want to know if this is also true when the background space-time is not flat, but a Schwarzschild one. To do that, we use it unru the with detectors, which are basically point-like two-level systems that couple couples linearly to the quantum field by the following Hamiltonian, where this small case t is the coordinate time, lambda is the coupling constant in between the detectors and the background and the field. Capital M is the redshift factor which is given by the derivative of the detector proper time with respect to the coordinate time. This eta is the switching function, which describes how the detector turns on and then turns off. And this is why it is bounded in between zero and one. Mu is a detector's monopole operator. It's just the usual, the usual monopole operator of a two-level system. And gamma is the word line that is followed by the detector. Notice that the word line is parameterized by the coordinate time. Also, you can see some sub-indexes D in some quantities. They are here due to a reason. We are going to use identical particle detectors. So in principle, many quantities will be the same for, two, for both detectors. However, whenever a quantity might not be the same in between uh, both two the, the two detectors, we are going to indicate that quantity uh, by a sub-index D. For instance, eta A would be the switching function for detector A, and eta B would be the switching function for detector B. And since the switching function might in principle be different, we are adding this sub-index to indicate that fact. Okay, so what our detectors do in our setup? So we, we choose to, to put both detectors in static word lines. So they are just sitting at some R coordinate, watching time pass. So they are standing still in their positions, just feeling time pass, separated only by an angle gamma, as we can see here. In this case of static detectors, the redshift factor is given by this expression. As the switching function, we choose a Gaussian switching function, where this small case t, 0d, indicates where the switching of detector d peaks. For instance, T0A equals to zero, which we are going to use, indicates that the switching of detector A peaks at the coordinate time T equals to zero. This is when the detector A is maximally, maximally turned on. This capital T, the so-called switching width, indicates uh, roughly the coordinate time interval in between switching on and then switching off the detectors. So it roughly indicates for how long our detector is actually interacting with the field. As the initial state, we choose a quantum state where both detectors are unentangled uh, with respect to one another and with respect to the field, and both are in their ground states. As I warned, we are going to take T0A equals to zero. And now 
In a Penrose diagram, we can represent everything that is happening only in this right wedge, because for this work, we are not considering uh, detectors inside the horizon. So everything happens in this region here, the right wedge of the Schwarzschild space-time. And we can represent, just to make it clear, the word lines that the, detect that the detectors are going to follow. So the detector's word line is this red line here, this dashed one. We can see the angular separation because uh, this is a conformal diagram. And we can also represent the switching function of detector B and the switching function of detector A. Now, the, the message here for, uh, for those switching functions is that they do have some, uh, they do have a limited support. Uh, I know that this is a Gaussian, so it actually goes, the, the support is everywhere in the space-time. However, they are stronger here. So the message is that the detectors are being turned on and then off, they are interacting with the field uh, with an appreciable uh, intensity for a limited amount of coordinate time. And also, the, the moments when, I detect the, when detector A is turned on might overlap with the moments when detector B is turned on. And this is represented by this superposition here. So depending on our choice of switching peak, both detectors might be turned on, turned on or, or off at the same time. With that setup, what we are trying to do our objective is to quantify the entanglement in between the detectors at t going to infinity. So after a lot of time has passed, how much entanglement they developed. And to do that, we evaluate the entanglement negativity at t going to infinity. Entanglement negativity is an entanglement monotone that allows us to quantify the amount of entanglement in a quantum system. To leading order in coupling, the entanglement negativity is given by this expression. So it's either uh, a positive number or zero. And we have two terms here, the M term and the L term. The M term is the non-local one, which is given by this expression. And we see a new thing appearing here, this capital omega, and this is just the detector's energy gap. And the other term, the L term, is given by this other expression with no new things appearing. However, notice how both terms are linearly dependent on the Whiteman function. So we are going to exploit that linearity as follows. We can define two new quantities, m plus and m minus, where m plus is defined as the m term evaluated with the imaginary part of the Whiteman, and the m minus is defined as m evaluated with the real part of the Whiteman function. So remember that the real part of the Whiteman function would be the state independent quantity while the, the imaginary part would be the state dependent quantity. So M plus quantifies the contribution to entanglement that is dependent on the state to leading order. This is the contribution to harvesting, while M minus determines the contribution that's not due to harvesting, but to communication. Then when the, when the M term is dominated by the contribution coming from M plus, we can conclude that we do have harvest, uh, harvesting dominated entanglement and when the dominating, dominating contribution to M is given by M minus, we can see that we do have a communication dominated entanglement. Now I'm going to present my results to you. In the left panel, we have a representation. This black, this black disk here is the, the black hole region. This circle, this black circle is the R equals to six times M roughly. This red dot is the position of detector A. And detector B is placed everywhere around the. Oh, wait, I'd like to pause the video, but I, I, well, I'm not trying to do that right now. On the left, we can see how the light cone is propagating from detector A. And on the right, we can see, oh, managed to do it. On the right, we see the quantities that are relevant to, to evaluate entanglement negativity. So on the right panel, we see M, M plus, M minus, and L. So this L is the noise term. M is this, this term that we use to evaluate the negativity. And M plus and M minus are the terms that we are going to use in order to evaluate uh, if we do have harvesting or not. Now, this is the, the blue shaded region you see here is the region where M plus is larger than M minus. So it's the region where harvesting might be happening. OK, now I'm going to play the video. Notice that we do have two peaks here in the M quantity. 
these two peaks, they are following the wave front on R equals to 6M. So these two peaks here are following this intersection in between the light cone and the R equals to 6M. And in the horizontal axis, we have gamma. And that gamma is the angular position of detector B. So for instance, when detector B is at gamma equals pi over four, we do have detector B getting entangled with detector A. When detector B is placed at gamma equals pi, we don't have it entangled with detector A, at least not yet. Up here, we see the difference in between T0B and T0A. I know there's a typo here. And T0A is set to be zero. So we are actually varying the peak of switching for detector B. And as we vary that peak of switching, detector B might capture uh, different signals. Now look at one thing that will happen when the light cone crosses itself. The green line will switch hole with the orange line. Ah, I tried to stop the video, but I was not successful with it. Okay, I wanted to show this. So notice how when the light cone uh, is beginning to self-intersect, the green line switch hole with the orange line. And then here, we do have the M term completely dominated by the M plus term, which is the state dependent contribution. Then this means that we do have uh, harvesting dominated entanglement in this situation. So near the caustic point, we do have entanglement dominated by harvesting while the communication dependent contribution is going to zero. And well, whenever the light cone crosses itself again, the green and orange line switch holes. And now I'm going to show you the same result from a different perspective, which is this one. Here we do have a, this is a small plot inside the bigger plot. And this small plot is showing us uh, TC, which is the coordinate time interval it takes for the light cone to self-intersect for the first time. So for instance, if, if we launch a light cone from the R equals to 3M, roughly, it will take uh, something like 16 uh, units of coordinate time to self-intersect. So this is what this plot is telling us, how much time the light cone takes to self-intersect, given that it was shot from a radi a R coordinate given by the values in the horizontal axis. On this other plot, on the background larger plot, we see the same quantities that were on the last plot. However, instead of varying the angle in between the detectors, we are actually varying the radial position where we placed both detectors, where this angular separation is kept constant and equals to pi. So we are always considering antipodal uh, detectors to the black hole, and they are placed further and further away. And we want to know what happens with each of these quantities. So you, we see a single peak here, and that single peak that's appearing here corresponds to the fact that we do have a single solution or a, a single value of TC for this given radius. Then the single peak splits into two peaks, one that goes closer to the horizon and one that is going away from the horizon. This corresponds to the fact that for this amount of coordinate time, we can have a peak that is close to the, close to the horizon, or we can have a peak that is further away from the horizon. And notice how in both situations, we have a region, a value of R, where the orange line is very close to the blue line, meaning that M is dominated by M plus, while the green line is almost zero, meaning that there is almost no contribution coming from the communication term. So the conclusion here is that even close to the horizon, we have the same e effects that we have seen before. Even clo close to the horizon, when you, when you put both detectors at antipodal positions, and when you turn on one detector close to the caustic point formed by a light cone launched from the other detector, we can have uh, entanglement harvesting. Uh, a small addition is that here, the switching width is kept constant with respect to the, to the detector proper time. In the last plot, it was kept constant with respect to the coordinate time. We have to compensate here uh, by making it constant with respect to the detector proper time to avoid effects coming from the redshift.
Okay. So is this also true for a Schwarzschild background space-time? And the answer is no. In a Schwarzschild space-time, harvesting is possible when the detectors are aligned along secondary neutral disks. That is when the detectors are close to the caustic points. So we can have entanglement even when the detectors are new separated in Schwarzschild space-time, provided that they are close to a caustic point. And this also happens to several radiuses, provided that the detectors have enough time to interact with the background field. This is why we corrected for the redshift factor, because if we have not corrected, then detectors very close to the horizon would have a very small amount of time to interact with the field. So summarizing, we do have harvesting close to the caustics, and that harvesting can happen even when detectors are placed very close to the horizon. And we can understand that in terms of the Hadamard form. By looking at the Hadamard form, we, we saw the first divergences that appear here. So in the real part, we had the PV singularity, and in the imaginary part, we had the delta singularity. However, the Whiteman function is known to follow a fourfold behavior. So what happens is that after crossing itself once, after the light cone crossing itself once, this PV singularity that appeared on the Hadamard form turns itself into a delta singularity. And when it crosses itself again, it turns into a PV singularity. And when it crosses itself again, it goes back to the delta singularity and then it repeats. So it's a, it's a fourfold cycle because it has four steps. And this is both for the real and imaginary parts. Now notice that before crossing it, before the light cone self intersecting, the real part, the state dependent part, the harvesting contributing part had a PV uh, singularity where the imaginary part, the state independent one, had a delta singularity. A delta singularity is much stronger than a PV singularity. This is why before crossing, it's before self intersecting, we had the dominant contribution coming from the imaginary part, which is the state independent part. Now, after the light cone crosses itself, these two singularities switch holes, and then we have a delta stronger singularity in the real part which is the state dependent part, the harvesting contributing part, and a PV singularity in the imaginary part, which is the state independent part. So that, that change in the singularity is what allows M plus to become dominant uh, in M. And this is what produces the effect we observed. So we are looking at something that is expect that, that happens due to the presence of these caustic points, which are those points where the light, light can self intersect. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time uh, this issue is studied in a three plus one dimensional space time. And the, re the result of this work was this publication. So now I'm going to present to you another thing I am working on with Mark. So we are trying to figure out correlations across the Schwarzschild horizon. And the motivation, well, it goes back again to Hawking radiation. We know that it's produced. And this is, this is supposed to be produced in pairs. So we have one mode outgoing to infinity, one mode falling, falling to the singularity of the black hole. And while in principle they are correlated, and we want to understand how they are correlated, where they are correlated, and how those correlations are spread across the space time. And for that, we are trying to evaluate a map of the Whiteman function where one point is fixed inside the horizon and another point is varying outside the horizon. So we can have a map of how the outside points are correlated to that inside point. To do that, we derived an expression, another mode sum expression for the Whiteman function, but now it's a mode sum expression that is valid when one point x prime is inside the horizon and the other point x is outside the horizon. And we have done this study, we have done only for the unruh state. The previous work was done for the three quantum states and the results were similar across all of them. This is why we presented only the results for the Bower state. <clears throat> to evaluate the Whiteman function in this situation, we have chosen V prime, the Kruskal V coordinate of the inside point to be fixed equals to one. This was an arbitrary choice. And by fixing V, we can write this U coordinate of the inside point as a function of R, the R coordinate of the inside point using the standard uh, relation in between Kruskal and Schwarzschild coordinates. And our choice for the inside point was to take its R coordinate to be equal to 0 0.77 black hole masses. And the outside point is taken to be in the right wedge, anywhere in the right wedge 
but not actually anywhere anywhere we do have data for because remember we have data for a limited range of uh, our coordinate outside the horizon so we produce the mesh of points those green points here outside the horizon and what we do is we pair each of these green points with this purple point and evaluate the Whiteman function. So we are evaluating the Whiteman function to get the correlations in between this purple point and each of the green points outside the horizon. Our results by doing that can be seen here. And well, they, they go as expected because in the real part of the Whiteman function that we see in the bottom left plot, we see the usual PV singularity that is expected on the direct new geodesic going from the outside points to the inside point. So we do have the expected PV singularity. And in the imaginary part, we do have the expected delta singularity whenever uh, a point on the line of V equals one is connected to the purple point inside. But the, okay, this is consistent with the Hadamard form, but the Hadamard form is known for a century now. So do we have anything new? Well, the answer is maybe, maybe by looking closer on that plot by looking at the surface of constant u. So by looking at the surface of u equals minus 665 and plotting the Whiteman function there as a function of v, we do see something. Well, at v equals one, we are only seeing the standard singularities that are expected from the Whiteman function. However, there, is, there seems to be something happening at v equals 10 to minus three. And we don't, we have not figured out, figured out yet what is causing the destructor here that, well, is not, I wouldn't say unexpected, but unpredicted or, or unexpected by us at least. And they are not being produced by those points being connected to the inside point by a new geodesic, because if this was the case, then we would know the form of the singularity that we are expecting to see in the Whiteman function. And this does not uh, agree with the expected form from the singularity from the Hadamard form. So this point should not be connected to the inside point by a new geodesic. Then do you have something new? Maybe we are still exploring, exploring what might be causing these singularities. <clears throat> now I'm going to present my final considerations beginning by a quick recap. So to the best of our knowledge, uh, our work is the first one trying to evaluate the Whiteman function in, the, in a full three plus one dimensional space time. And our efforts are paying off. We have shown by using the data we produced that caustics makes it possible to harvest entanglement even when two detectors are no separated. And this is true even very close to the horizon, provided that the, the, the systems that are trying to harvest entanglement have enough proper time to interact with the background field. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, you are trying to produce that map of correlations using the Whiteman function. And we hope that if successful, these would be a valuable tool to, to better understand how the correlations are distributed on the field. And to this point, we are still investigating what might be causing the unexpected features that were presented. <clears throat> for future, as future directions, we remark that we do have a massive amount of data because we had to produce a lot of data in order to evaluate the quantities we have evaluated. And we are now in a unique position because we have a lot of data for the three plus one dimensional Schwarzschild space time, and we can explore many things using that data. <clears throat> Depending on the results we have after finishing the map of the Whiteman function, we might extend it to the case where both points are also inside the horizon. So we have a really complete map of correlations. We plan to keep working with the, our collaborators in the harvesting setups. And we do have at least more, two more setups in mind to explore. One is two infalling detectors. So how would harvesting work when two detectors are infalling? And the other one, maybe the most interesting one, is if can two detectors on opposite sides of the horizon perform entanglement harvesting? So the second one, I, I believe, would be a very interesting setup to explore. So this was my, my qualification. I would like to thank everyone for the attention, Mark for supervising me, uh, the Exa Miners for being here, CBPF for making it all possible, and CNPQ for the financial support. So thank you all. And this, is my, this was my, my qualification. OK, thanks very much, Gabriel, uh, Jean. Um, so now we, we go to some um, questionings and, and, and 
our, uh, so I'll first let uh, Professor Alessandro Fabri like put some comments, remarks, and so please feel free. Please. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, uh, it was a very nice presentation, very clear to the point, and uh, it was nice to listen to it. So my congratulations. Thank you. Well, I'm not a lot of a lot of expert in the first part on the on the entanglement and harvesting. Actually, the question that I had are the questions that you put at the end. <laughs> so if instead of uh, static detectors, you consider different movements, is it difficult to to extend the computation that you did? Not at all. We just have to derive the to, to derive the modes to derive the mode sum expression and then run the numerical evaluation again. We already have the data for it. We even have the data for one detector inside and one outside. It's just a matter of uh, doing that. Okay, so that's good. Um, you mentioned state dependent. Let's let's keep to the first part. Huh? State dependent terms and the state dependent is Boulevard or Arthur Hawking and Undru. Are there differences? I I, don't, I haven't understood if considering different quantum state we have different features and which ones okay so when regarding harvesting the conclusions that we will get by considering the other two quantum state the video that i have shown you was for the bower state now okay. have i shown you the videos for the unru or the heart of hawking state we would not be able to distinguish them visually so they are very similar qualitatively and quantitatively okay. they are not the same but in order to see the differences, we have to look at the relative the relative difference in between in between them because they agree to several digits. Now the only difference is the expected one, where the noise term, the transition probability, it's different in between the three quantum states. In the Boer state, we have the smaller transition probability. In the Unruh state, we have an intermediary transition probability, and in the Hart or Hawking state, we have the larger transition probability. But the difference is very small. But this is what one would expect. Now, given that okay, so, so in a sense the results are somehow state independent then at the end yeah the we effects, can say that no the effects are state mm -hmm. independent the har the conclusion about harvesting the possibility of harvesting is state independent are you planning to consider uh, more complicated space times maybe after we finish exploring everything we can in Schwarzschild. yeah yeah, yeah. we sh you should do in Schwarzschild before of course as I was thinking to Reiser Nostrum. Yeah. Well, in principle, the bar here would be evaluating the mode solutions to the Reiser Nostrum space time and repeating everything. So we, we might explore that after we finish exploring the Schwarzschild space time. Okay, but uh, it, technically it won't be, no, it will be just a technical problem, no? Conceptually, it will be the same, not too difficult. Yeah, the, the the main challenge in this in this the main challenge in these works is producing the data, producing the modes, because we had to produce a, a lot of data points. Yes, yes. When you in your uh, in your uh, work, when you define the negativity, you say it's where is yeah the maximum of a different of terms. And you have discussed in the presentation n plus and minus, which is related to the commutator and the commutator of the Whiteman function. And I see a note saying that also the LDD part is state dependent, but you don't seem to take this into account. Uh, okay. The L well, the LDD it is state dependent because it's written in terms of the Whiteman, and the Whiteman it varies among the three quantum states. Uh, oh, well, I have not enforced that, but the LDD, the no which is the noise term, it changes if we change the quantum state. But the difference, the quantitative difference is very small and not sufficient to produce any qualitative difference uh, in, in between the, all the plots. Okay, okay, okay. So it's, there, it's not relevant, I understand.
And so this is the first work on uh, entanglement. Well, probably entanglement is partially is too is too is too general. On work on harvesting or communication in Schwarzschild, there is nothing there is else a, in literature. There is another work, uh, also by Mark and David, which was his student recently, where they explored the possible on another issue which was not related to harvesting. They explored uh, issues related to communication. So they they made calculations like the channel capacity and how the presence of a black hole would make it easier or more difficult to communicate if the, if two detectors are trying to communicate near a black hole region. So for harvesting, this work is the first one. And for the Schwarzschild, well, this is one of the very few works available uh, in the full three, three plus one dimensional situation. Is, is, has you, anyone did done something in one plus one dimension? No. Yeah, uh, regarding harvesting, there is a work by by Jorma Loco and a couple other, I can't remember the, all the other names, but there is one work where, by, where Jorma Loco participated, where he explored not harvesting, but the response function of a single detector that was infalling uh, down the black hole. And, and the interesting issue that he saw is that there is a small bump in the response in the response function of a single detector slightly after it crosses the horizon but he was exploring a single slightly detector after okay so yeah. it could go inside yeah of course in mm -hmm. one plus one dimension there is no problem and this is this is what he saw but he was working but not uh, to detectors but not to detectors no, no not to detectors but usually you know this one plus as, as we will discuss in the second part uh, one plus one dimensional computation are useful because they give intuition. So nobody have, 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 nobody has done the, the the one plus one dimensional counterpart of your computation. I should have started by that. I think no. Uh, I'm a, I'm aware only only of flat space time calculations that are, that are analogous to what I presented. So the second plot that I shown, the second video, which is a, uh, the same as the first one, but from a different perspective, this can be directly compared with a work that is done in open world dimension, dimensions, but that was done for flat space time. So at least I'm not aware of other works exploring the short. But you could situation. do that. You could do that because it's uh, given the amount of technicalities that are involved in a three plus one calculation you should do it in a half an hour, I think. No. Sorry, I don't yes, know if you're not, but just to say it has been done by Robert Mann and collaborators in one plus one Schwarzschild. And did you are you aware? Is it comparable to what you have? Because usually you you use this result to get intuition. So it, 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 you know, there's no caustics in one plus one. There's no nothing. So there like is that. nothing. So there is no. nothing. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, the the right uh, the right answer. Very good. Okay. So the second part. You only have one point. Ah, first of all, let me understand the expression for the Whiteman function that you put in your presentation when one point is outside and one point is inside. Can you show it? Yes, 3.1 or, or in your present, yeah, yeah, 3.1, yeah. So the, the point inside, so R prime, the corresponding term in this equation, I don't see it, it just disappeared. Oh. Okay, back here. Is this R ins? which is defined in equation 117, no, yes, 117, which if I understand corresponds to an ingoing mode on the future horizon no, of unit amplitude. 
Let me see. 117. One seventeen. Yeah. yeah so a... when when you when you when you multiply but e to the minus i omega t, you have one minus i omega v. So mm -hmm. you have a unit amplitude in going mode on the future horizon. Yeah, but it's also defined inside the horizon. But at, at the future. No, no, no. But then this could be considered as a boundary condition, and you have evolution inside the horizon, and you have mm -hmm. scattering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to construct the two-point function, you also need a mode which is defined in the past horizon inside the horizon and which is unit amplitude and which is outgoing. So it should be e to the i omega r star. Well, what we have done to construct this Whiteman function that we have seen was to consider a field, the field mode, the field expansion. Uh, like this and for that field expansion we use the expression for the unru modes given here so we have this capital in modes yeah so the up l are not relevant here because they say they are defined in the region capital v less than zero well the the up l you see, they have support only on the left wedge. So we so, are not considering any point on the left wedge. So, okay, so, so the up so the L give no contribution in the expression 3.1 that you are using, right? Right. In, in the end, when you set the inside point to be inside the horizon or and right. the outside point outside the horizon on the right wedge, every term that has dependence on the L modes, they go to zero. But then... Uh, and when, when I do my computation, you you know, uh, and I the, how can I show you this? Do you see? Do you see this? Do you see this? This is the past horizon. Okay, this is the future uh, the future horizon. Mm -hmm. So there is the portion of the past horizon which is inside the horizon for which I define the mode, which is outgoing. And which is scattered. Mm -hmm. I wonder if these modes here are present in your expression because these are crucial to get Hawking radiation. Well, and and the, the way R ints are uh, defined, it seems to me this is just terms. If you want, so this is the, your in mode, which go to the horizon, and then from here they evolve from the past horizon to. Okay, this is this is an acoustic black hole. Don't worry, <laughs> but uh, uh, they they start from the past, the, the the future horizon, and then they they evolve. Whereas, as I told you, most most very important modes are those that I showed you because. This is where Hawking the, the correlation comes from, at least for the partner, which are these modes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if these modes, at least from the expression that you wrote, you know if these modes are there or not. Well, okay, let me show you uh, an expression that is prior to that one. Now I, I do have it. Okay, so the full the full expression without considering anything to be, well, I don't know if you can, well, it's a very poor. One yeah, second, no, no, can... no, show it, show it, show it. Don't worry, don't worry, show it. As I did it, I mean, I showed you. Uh... Okay. So th this would be the full expression without setting any term to zero. So the L modes, they are here. Okay, so the L modes give contribution inside the horizon of the black hole, right? Uh, because you see, because because the way you wrote, you said that the L modes uh, have support on capital V negative, so they seem not to be relevant because the the, the black hole horizon, mm -hmm, the interior of the horizon is capital V positive. 
yeah that's it so that was the case so this is this is why no 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 none of them ended up con uh, contributing to the final expression to mm. the Whiteman function okay so do you have in your expression the modes that i showed you this one then the question is this one this this modes here i don't know if you can because basically modes which are defined as unit amplitude on the past horizon inside the horizon and then they evolve do you have this i don't think i have this they they would come there they would be modes that on the on the future horizon they would be modes inside the black hole that on the future horizon for the left the left future horizon would be would match the l the ingoing l modes at the horizon so i don't have them in this calculation at least not it's not clear to me so yeah we should uh, we should we should discuss that because uh, i mean in principle they should be there okay. i i'm not i'm not able to understand from your expression if they are there or not mm -hmm. but if they aren't then uh, it's there is a missing thing okay okay so as far as the calculation have been done you are only able to fix one point inside the horizon we have data for many other points inside the horizon okay. so we could have fixed any point from 0 0.77 m up to 2 m however uh, our choice for the innermost point yes. was well i think one work which you have participated, which explored an analog model. So you're yes. exploring, I think, uh, a signature that is left by the Hawking pairs. Uh, you also made the calculation on a Schwarzschild one plus one, if I yes. remember, if, if I'm remembering yeah, well. Yeah, we only we only do that. <laughs> and you you rem you concluded that one of your conclusions was that well the innermost point would allow for the for the outgoing partner to for, for the relation the correlation in between them to live for more time because uh well the the outgoing partner would have more time to uh yeah but the, again the... again again this is another thing the the expression 3.1 that you write is okay it's for the time t and t prime in principle can be different no yeah in principle they can be different so okay so the the idea was that if you allow for uh, ah but this is partial time what what which time are you using, by the way? This is important. Okay, so the, the expression that I presented, it is written in terms of, I believe it's written in terms of Schwarzschild coordinates. Mm. However, in order to actually perform the numerical computation, we change it, all these Schwarzschild coordinates to Kruskal coordinates, because since we are, uh, well, everything we do in the background is, is, is in Kruskal coordinates, so that we don't have to worry with issues like, the t coordinate outside and the t coordinate inside are different coordinates so it, it will be you, you have globally right. defined time no you have yeah, globally defined have. time no so we, okay, we yeah, would rather do now. everything in a set of globally defined uh, coordinates so instead of t and r in the expression that we use to numerically evaluate we have u and v u and v kruskal you mean yeah kruskal u and v okay because it's better because otherwise if you have one point inside one point outside this delta t which is in uh, equation 3.1 is not very meaningful mm -hmm. okay so our, our objective well, by doing that was also to have something that would be uh, independent of the choice of coordinates what do you mean i mean we, if if you have a map of the whiteman function uh, on in a in a penrose diagram you can then interpret give an interpretation for that by choosing any foliation you want and you can see what would happen in that foliation so you can see what that what an observer with uh whose clocks measure a given t coordinate would see for instance and you can choose that and just put it on top of the the map of the whiteman function and have an intuition about for about what he's going to see mm. but 3.1 is for Schwarzschild time yes it's for Schwarzschild coordinates 3.1 is for Schwarzschild coordinates. Okay. Okay, so your idea would be 
to play with the time difference properly defined mm -hmm. and to see if you can get a feature. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so in all our papers, we never computed. Actually, I don't know if you can see this feature in the two point function. What we all we have always computed is this density density. So, yep. which means derivative of the two point function plus geometrical factors. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, but it's something that could be done easily, at least in one plus one dimension, to see if the feature that we discovered in the density density can be seen in the two point function. Density density, I think, is a technique to amplify, to see it better. But I don't mm -hmm. know if it, is, if it is present there or not. But this is something that can be looked at in two dimension because it's easy. There is a paper by Schutzholt and Munru, yes, I think from 2010, yes, where they they do the calculation for the density density case, yes. but they also show how the expression would be for the the field field instead of density density, and by plotting by by plotting the field field case instead of the density mm -hmm. density, we see the future the feature but with a different form because what they saw was a bump in the density mm -hmm. density. However, in the field field, we see something like a step, a step that is uh, the the step part. The, this part of the step is centered uh, in the center of the bump. Mm, but, okay. So you think there is? Okay. I think we can. I think we we'll, we would be able to see something, but I, I'm not sure if that thing would be clear. Yes. Yeah. It, I, I'm sure it will be more difficult to see, but. Uh... But what mm. we think is. Since the we are considering three three quantum states that can be defined by the, their two point functions, and all correlations in this quantum state can be written in terms of this two point function. So, in principle, that this two point function would carry information about all these correlations. Right, like but the point is to, to see. Yeah, to understand the point is to see which observable, which quantity shows better the feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then, in principle. You can repeat your computation with derivatives. I mean, uh, instead of just the two-point function computing the stress energy tensor correlator or something like that. This is something I know because you have to take uh, derivatives of the mode function, so it will be difficult, no? It's I, not something I, that you can use right away with your data. You have to I've, redo the computation. We do have data for the derivatives because at the time we were computing the, the modes, we also taken the opportunity to compute the derivatives, but I'm not sure if we have the derivatives for the ingoing modes. Now, this is something I would have to check because we, we focused on the Whiteman, but at, the, for, at least for the upgoing modes, we do have the derivatives. Yeah. You mentioned that there is no problem with the infrared divergence, no? The infra yeah. The only problem that would appear in, in one plus one d, it's the two point function is useless because it's infinite. <laughs> so, so doing it in three plus one, of course, is more interesting, you know. Yeah. So the only problem that would appear cancels out. I mean, it was a very lucky, a very lucky issue, I'd say. Uh, that cancellation is shown in the in the qualification text. In yeah, you eight. you in figure eight, okay. Yeah, so but the, uh, it it's probably by construction infrared finite. No, is there well, a reason why it's 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 an accident that it is infrared finite? Because in two D there is no hope, just divergent. I honestly don't. Can't. I honestly don't have a, a an opinion about that. I mean about the. The heuristics of why we would expect this to be infrared and not problematic. I ha I haven't given a thought about it. I just verified it numerically for safety because if it was divergent yes. Uh, yes. for small frequencies, then yeah, I think it, I think in two dimensions probably because there is this large contribution, there is the infrared divergence, so it's the two point function is infinite. It's probably the reason one looks at derivatives like, like the density density correlator. So maybe in three plus one, it is enough to restrict to, to this quantity. Okay. 
And, well, and now, yes, tell me, tell me. Oh, one. There is one thing that I I forgot to mention is that this uh, exp- we are using uh, a smoothing factor to evaluate this this Whiteman function. We are smoothing the frequencies using a strong smoothing, which is a Gaussian smoothing with a standard deviation of, of three. So, uh, frequency modes with frequencies lower than three are mostly not contributing to the calculation. Okay. So this is large frequencies then? No, we are we are using mostly small frequencies. Frequencies from zero up to three contributes the most. Uh, larger frequencies are, are being killed because they would make uh, some weird oscillations appear in the in the final calculation. Okay. So uh, again, uh, you think you have uh, you have discovered something? Can you show? Talk about this again to see if there is something relevant in what we are discussing. Okay. So what I have shown that is, I mean, out of the usual that we have found in this calculation is this issue here. So basically, these two plots here show the Whiteman function with the purple point fixed in, fixed inside. And well, the other yes. points varying along the u equals to minus sixteen sixty five uh, coordinate. In the left, we see a log plot. On the right, we see a linear plot version, but they are the same quantity. Yes. Now I pointed that this is not expected to be the the kind the kind of thing happening due to a new geodesic connecting this point to the inner point, because if it was a new geodesic connecting these two points. Then in that fourfold structure, we will be able to see uh, some one of the four combinations matching the structures we see here, and it doesn't it don't match with any of them. So, so the new thing is related to the appearance, for instance, in the in the right plot of a minimum. Sorry, can you repeat that? The the new thing you're talking about ah. is, for instance, the fact that in the right plot you have a minimum. Uh, well, it's a typical feature. Well, I mean this. Well, we have this. Oh, there's, there's oscillation happening in the left of the plot. Mm-hmm. This would be the the thing that we see. What we expect, what was expected, is this feature uh, centered at v equals one, which is well, expected by the Hadamard form. Yeah. So this is far away. So the points are far away. What you see is for points far away. No. Uh, X yeah. prime is fixed, and X is where. X prime is fixed, it, fixed, and X would be, well, somewhere very close visually, at least, not exactly yeah. there, but visually very close to I minus. So visually very close to this point. And I have evaluated the, the value of R, which is equivalent to that position. I'm I have not I'm not showing it here, but it was close to the horizon. It was a value of R. I mean, two point something. I can't remember right right now. Uh, uh, by heart, but it was two it's, point something. It's a, it was close to the horizon. Whereas the point inside the horizon is close to the singularity, no? Yeah. As close as we have data for. But you say it's close to past time like infinity, so t equal to minus infinity? Yeah, now there is this thing because the Penrose diagram, it heavily distorts everything near these regions. So visually close might not mean that the, this t is going really is, is a really small number. Uh, all I yeah, have but the, it's it's not it's not late time. It's not what we call late time, by the way. No, no. no. Hmm. But then Unru ah, in, uh, this is Unru space. Unru, Unru. Yeah. So the Unru state is supposed to be physically relevant at late times. So, what happens if you consider later values of time? This thing di- disappears. It's just a transient. Well, if we consider late time, well, we don't have data. For instance, if if I wanted to extend this plot past v equals one, I would have yes. to produce more more points uh, on that green mesh that I presented. 
And this is something I have not, I have not, I haven't known uh, yet. Now, if we vary this u so that the uh, the u equals constant line moves closer to the moves closer to the horizon, if we do that, then yes. this feature uh, disappears. But I believe it disappears uh, because as we move closer to the horizon, because due to the way we have chosen to make our mesh, I think the, yes. our data is limited before uh, the position where the, the feature happens. Ah, because you all you are always quite you're always quite close to the horizon. You mean so 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 increasing time, you're more and more closer to the horizon because of the mesh you are using. Increasing. Uh, well, it's difficult to, for instance, this u equals minus 16, 665, it includes points that are both close to r equals 2, but also include a point that is very far from r equals 2. The, what I meant was that the in the diagram, the line representing, uh, as the line representing the surface of constant u we are considering moves closer to h plus, but visually closer, uh, due to the way we choose uh, the points in our mesh, this feature uh, vanishes away. Okay. Um, and uh, for instance, um, uh, when we do the analysis in Schwarzschild or in analog models, we always predict that the pairs of the Hawking effect uh, they are defined by the condition u equal to u prime. So u is the mm -hmm. outgoing and the Finkelstein. So given that you fixed inside the point, interior point, is it possible that you fix the interior point in order that you can see the, uh, the region around? So the, you fix u prime, let's put it this way, mm -hmm. and then you you try to understand what happens if you consider two point function with the exterior point in the region around the u the, the u equal to u prime condition is it can you do that yes that would be a matter of uh, modifying the code have you done that system. no have you done that, that? Can, no i can do okay. that but uh, it's it it would be a matter of modifying the code that produces the mesh of points so that it produces the mesh of points around the the u fix it to be equals to u prime, and then run the, the code to evaluate the values of the white one on that point. So the only modification we would have to do is to produce, modify the code that produces a mesh of points. That That is the only modification. Okay. I think that would be interesting because it could give, uh, it could be a way to see if there is a, the predicted things because, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes, it will be at an equal time, no? T different from T, well, T, the, 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 the time of the interior exterior points in the global times are different in, in general, no? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I can, I can choose coordinates so that uh, we can fix U equals U prime and a notion of maybe the Gustav Panglevé time, which is the one yes. uh, I see everyone yes. using. Yes. Maybe we can fix u equals u prime, Gustav Panglevé yes. time outside equals inside, and run a mesh around that point. We can do that. Okay. Okay. Or you can allow for one of the two times to change in order to see how much time difference one needs to see something. Mm -hmm. like, th th this is also possible. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I mean, the only thing, it, maybe it's not a mistake, yes. but at the very beginning yes. of our work, uh, where we were still beginning to evaluate everything, we decided that evaluating the solutions in even steps of the tortoise coordinate might be a good idea. However, in the end, for to produce this plot, it would have been better to evaluate everything in even steps of Kruskal coordinates. But well, the, the downside would be that maybe... Uh, we would lose a lot of effects because the steps would be very uneven. So, uh, well. So it's a, it's a matter of calculation, no? Yeah. Okay. So if, if we can use the, if 
if we conclude that the set of points we have would be enough, then great. But that, but they would be enough to see things happening between 2.09 and 10.18. Anything that happens in, uh, for radiuses in between 2 and 2.09, it's outside of our data. But of course, we can evaluate the new data. However, it becomes more difficult because the upgoing modes using the MST method, they get increasingly difficult to evaluate as we move closer to the horizon. The ingoing modes are really simple, really simple and really quick to evaluate, but the upgoing modes, they are very time consuming and difficult as well, okay. computationally difficult. Okay. So, so the, the final, uh, final thing, if you are able to see the correlation of the Hawking effect mm -hmm. by suitably fixing points inside and outside, then you could probably apply the techniques of the first part of your uh, work to, com yep. to consider free falling detectors inside mm -hmm. and outside to see the entanglement in the Hawking effect, maybe, no? Because, yeah. Precisely. Because th yep. this is the way to analyze entanglement. That would okay. Be, I, mean, it, yeah. it, I think it would be very nice if, in the end, we concluded that. It's possible to make two detectors on opposite sides of the horizon entangled. Yes, that, yes, that would be, that would be very interesting. That would be very interesting. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, congratulations again. I like very much both the presentation and the work that you did. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and for the suggestions on the points you made. Believe in us, possible for a commentary or no? Maybe no. Uh, um not officially but uh yeah i guess we'll be yeah welcome go ahead mark say but go ahead just two quick things one is about the modes that uh sandra was talking about we do include them so where is... because i don't see because i don't see it in the expression no yeah but FR in... because you can relate so john says they're only supported on the left side but what's but the, the thing is there, so we use little little in and capital up. The capital up modes are modes that are coming in from H, the past horizon and from HL. And those are, I think that the ones that are coming in from HL, the left horizon are the ones that you're referring to. Mm. What happens is you can relate the left modes to the right modes via complex conjugation. So they're included. Mostly. Well, uh, again, 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 it's it's a complex conjugation. We are talking about exterior and interior of the horizon. So you cannot you cannot uh, 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 um, produce the interior modes by complex conjugation of the exterior ones because the regions are different. Well, I, I, I believe that they are there. Huh? I just want to understand, <laughs> of course. <laughs> you have to change V to minus U and V to minus V, apart from the complex conjugation. And that relates to... Ah, okay. You mean, you mean uh, the, the L modes are defined what? In the, in the white hole region? And then by the co complex conjugation, you have them in the interior region, in the black hole region, something like Relative. that? You can relate the radial parts in that way, but of course right. you have the full 40 thing to also change you to minus you. But, but you are saying that they are there. The modes I'm talking about, they are there, no? They have to be there, otherwise... Uh... Yeah. And, and the, other comment, the other comment is a question. I didn't understand your comment about, did you say u equals u primes? Yeah, so the, 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 the condition that we have to spot to, to see the correlation between the part let's say the, the 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 particle outside and the partner inside is that the um, the outgoing end of Finkelstein coordinate of the two are the same u equal to u prime. I'm confused now. So that th these are coordinates that are irregular on the future yeah. horizon. Right. They are they are they are pl they are plus infinity on the future horizon. So, that, and so, that, so what, what does you program mean when they're totally unrelated? The inside one, the outside, the inside you. Well, the... let's say in a sense, both they are defined equal to plus infinity on future, on, on, uh, uh, on the future horizon, okay? 
So going yeah, far uh, away from from going going far away from there in the interior and exterior, you have finite use. I don't know what you mean. Far away from infinity means. You mean if you go if you go I, from the you, future horizon. Them. You're defining a Dennington Finkelstein little u, both inside and outside. Both blow yes. up in the future horizon. So I think it's meaningless to say little u inside equals to little u outside because the origins of those are totally unrelated. Let's They're say, totally uh, you, then let, let's do, do this way. We define it in terms of uh, uh, v and r, okay? v is in going uh, Eddington Finkelstein. Okay, you write u equal to v minus 2 r star and u prime equal to v prime minus 2 r star, star prime. And then you impose that these two quantities are the same. So this is, is the condition. You define, you, you define v minus 2 r star, okay? V, I think Tom Finkelstein, v minus 2 r star. Right, right. And for the interior point and the exterior point, and you pose you impose that these two things equal to being the same. Not on the horizon, of course, but for a point uh, outside and inside. I'm too confused. I mean, our star also blows up on the it's irregular on the right, horizon. but I don't want to be on the horizon, just considering okay. points inside the and horizon. outside. But the origin of the R star coordinate inside and the origin of the R star coordinate outside are totally unrelated as well. Again, if you are on the outside and you go to the horizon, R star goes to plus infinity. If you are in the inside and you go to the future horizon, R star goes to plus infinity as well. Exactly. That, that's my point. And the origin but, of the R star again, inside yes. and outside are totally unrelated. So, I think anything that's given in terms of adding from let's single... put it in this way. No, no, let's put it in this way. Uh, the two point function in, in for the for a 2D field in the UNRU state is defined in terms of log of the difference of the Kruskal coordinate U, capital U minus capital U prime. Okay. Then once you replace the dependence of U in terms of the small U inside and outside. Then this is how the, this condition comes about. Okay, I mean, but you have to define the, you have to define inside you and 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 outside you. But okay. again, they come they come from the Kruskal coordinates. Exactly. If you phrase it in terms of Kruskal coordinates, then then I'm starting right. to. Come in. Yeah. So I can well, see the, you want uh, it. Probably you can you can you can rephrase it in terms of the uh, log of. Uh, Say again, it's, I'm not sure, it could be that uh, absolute value of U, capital U, equal to absolute value capital of U prime, probably. Okay, okay. That, that's a different thing, right? Now we're talking about... But again, I know, but again, but again, the, the, you, yeah, but the, 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 the expression that you have is nicely written in terms of... of uh, Outgoing and it on Finkelstein, which is the entire which is defined in terms of the outs, uh, out exterior and interior plus coordinate. But you can define them. Oh. So the, yes, the, the, the so basic nice thing is capital U. Yeah. Well, Mark, maybe it's better to continue discussing for future work. It's it's not even right. So it's future work. So nice, nice topic to, to discuss. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mark. So, Alessandro, I I've are done. I'm I've, I've satisfied. Can I can I jump in? Sorry. To make can I jump in? Make some questions to João. Are you done? Are you satisfied? Of course. Of course. Why okay. don't you ask me? Yeah, yeah. Of okay. course. Of course. No, no. Okay. So thanks very much yeah. for your contributions. Uh, so João. I, I don't have much left to 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 ask you. Um, first of all, I think it's a very nice it's a it's a qualification, so it's not your PhD. So you're I think you are in the right track. Nice work, very technical and very very robust, I would say. Yeah. 
Uh, I have like uh, small comments. Uh, some of them you, you, you clarify in your presentation, specifically the physical, uh, the physical meaning of uh, several things that mm -hmm. uh, miss in the text, but uh, clearly you, you discuss in, in your presentation. So like the meaning of the vacuums and stuff like that. So I'm not going to, to ask you on this. Um, maybe, oh, one thing that uh, I missed is on page 12, you, you were defining entanglement, like the, the maximum of the difference between M psi and the, the LDD, right? Mm -hmm. I missed that the LDD is noise. It is pure noise, or that's why you define this different? Because my question was, it's not enough to have um, M different from zero to, to say that you have entanglement? Uh, so you, if it is noise, I understand, but uh, I, I missed it. So LDD is noise, it, it is? Yeah, LDD is noise. It's a, you can understand it as a transition probability. Uh, yeah. The, the spontaneous transition probability that it has just, to, to, just because it's interacting with the field. So it might, one detector might get excited without necessarily mm -hmm. being correlated to the other detector. So if, if the probability mm -hmm. of this happening is higher than the probability of the detector getting excited but correlated to the other detector then well it will spoil the entanglement okay no it's fine i just missed in the text that uh, ldd was noise so maybe it's somewhere but um, so if it is noise makes sense for me that's that's fine um so uh so i have actually i have uh well, so when you say you have a lot of data and you have, so you mean you, you computed uh, all the functions for these three vacuum states, is that right? For the Schwarzschild uh, space time. That's what you mean, a lot of data. Well, you have a lot of points, you have the, the, the Whiteman functions for all these points for these three uh, vacuum states, is that right? Yeah, but uh, I, I was referring to the solutions because look, we, we evaluated the solutions from 10 to minus 3 up to 10 in steps of mm -hmm. 10 to minus 3. So for each frequency, we have 10,000 data points. But for each data point, we had to evaluate from L equals 0 up to 100. So we, are now, we now have 100 times 10,000 points, which is a million, maybe 10 million mm -hmm. points. And each of these 10 million solutions were evaluated in each of the radiuses in our uh, in that in our in the range that we have chosen. So this is this is this was the lot of data. Now from that data we can evaluate many things, including the Whiteman function for the three quantum states if wanted and things like that. But it, but but you cannot do for different states, right? It, yeah, it I can depends do on the states. Mm -hmm. You can do for uh, uh, different states, vacuum states, or. Yeah, the thing is that the the, the di different set of, if you choose, uh, we'll, when you quantize the field, you can make the field expansion in terms of the field modes. Now, depending on your choice of modes, you get a different quantum state. So the, the, the thing is that the set of modes defining the UNRU and defining the Hartle-Hawking state can be written in terms of the set of modes defining the Bower state. Mm -hmm. So we evaluated the small case in and the small case up modes. However, the capital in and the capital up, which are the modes we use to define the other two quantum states, they can be written in terms of the small case in and up. So by evaluating these two, these two modes, we get many possibilities. So we can evaluate everything for the other two quantum states because the, other two, the modes of the other two quantum states can be written mm -hmm. in terms of the Bower modes. But if you if you want to, to calculate for an excited state something like this, so um, you have to redo everything. Is that right? Well, I, you... I don't think so. I, I, would, I would have to, for instance, say that I want to evaluate the two point function, but for an excited state of the system in the, well, okay. Ex an excited state would already be a, a different state because the, the Unruh, mm -hmm. Bower and Hartle Hawking are the vacuum states. Yes. Now we can, of course, we can take the Bowers, the Unru state, and apply uh, some creation operator to the Unru state. That would, this would give us an expression for that quantum mm -hmm. state. Then we just smear the, the the field squared in between them and see what comes out of it. But whatever comes out of it, 
can be written in terms of the unruh state modes, which can be written in terms of the buber state modes. So we can, we, we have everything we, we, we would- Okay, you can, you can build on it. Okay, I understand, mm -hmm. yeah, I understand. Okay, so another question to understand, it's not like questioning you, but uh, for me to understand. So you, you, you're discussing harvesting, right? Not communication. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that in, in flat space time, you don't have this harvesting, right? But you, you you found in in, in Schwarzschild space time the signal, yeah. so uh, and and you make a um, you made a, a illustration with the system A, B, and C and how the difference between communication and harvesting and it, you warn it that this is just illustration. But uh, I got the impression that that when you're harvesting something, you are getting information from that system for in, in your illustration for the system C. So in your space times uh, analogy would mean that you are getting some information from the black hole and some kind of quantum information from the black hole because it only happens when you have this uh, curved space time. So is this right? So meaning that if you get harvesting, this signal is, is giving you some quantum uh, curve space time information or from the black hole. I got confused, really. Uh, okay. So a, a few things. So can you clear we, this this mess up, please? <laughs> mm -hmm. We do have harvesting in flat space time, but only for space-like separated detectors. And well, if they are space-like and very separated, harvesting goes to zero. So they must be mm -hmm. space-like separated and close each to one another. When they are okay. new separated, then we don't have harvesting. In flat space time, mm -hmm. new separated detectors do not produce harvesting. All the entanglement that they end up with is produced uh, by direct, direct communication. And the same for, uh, well, we do, we do have a, couple, a little uh, region and for time-like separations where we can also have harvesting. So the difference in our result is that we concluded that for new separated detectors in Schwarzschild space time, we can have harvesting. This is in contrast to the, to the result in flat space time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, does it mean that we can we are getting information about the background field? It doesn't mean well what we are getting from the from, from the background field. We are we are stealing correlations that exist in the that in the vacuum of the background field. However, you can't use, for instance, you. I would say that you uh, in the same way you can't you you'd have to to be moving at a speed faster than light to escape from a black hole, information would also need to move faster than light to, to get outside of the black hole. So uh, this does not happen because you can't use entanglement to send information faster than light. So what mm -hmm. we get is that, okay, now the what happens is that two degrees of freedom are entangled. Now they are not entangled anymore, but this, the two detectors are entangled. So this is what we get. We get current, we steal the correlation, but not the information that is built into but built into that correlation. Mm, okay. Oh, something close that uh, happens with the self force, right? Something that uh, the curved space time gives you like no trivial self correlations or stuff like that. So yeah, so so you're not getting out of uh, uh, you're not getting information from the black hole you're just uh, making the system um, non trivially self correlate in, in different points uh, different space time points something like this yeah yeah it's something like this for instance okay. in in the case suppose that two detectors can harvest entanglement and one detector inside the horizon gets entangled with one detector outside the horizon we can't mm -hmm. use that entanglement to transmit information so we mm -hmm. can have the correlation. I can be sure that a measurement done by the outside detector is correlated to whatever measurement the inside detector uh, also makes, but I don't know what he's doing with his uh, with his part of the, the state. You can't mm -hmm. use okay. Uh, the, his. Okay. And another, another question on this uh, to make uh, sense of it. So you are ignoring completely the left, the left uh, uh, part of the diagram, the, the mm -hmm. general diagram, because it's causally disconnected. But you were talking about the quantum field, so you you cannot have like uh, some kind of tunneling uh, effects and um, something leaking from the right hand side to the left hand side. 
So you couldn't be like missing energy, matter, or something like this from tunneling or getting from the left hand side. You're not throwing this kind of physics away when you you completely throw away everything from the left hand side. Or so when what happens? Th there is a difference uh, uh, in what I have done and in really throwing away because, for instance, uh, the Unru effect is something that happens in flat space time, and it can be shown that the complete the, the vacuum of the field in the complete Minkowski space-time is a pure state. However, when you go to a, a Rindler observer, the, the Minkowski space-time divides, I believe, into four regions. So you also have a right wedge, a left wedge, uh, an upper and a bottom wedge. And it can be shown that, okay, in the wedge, the right wedge, where this observer can, uh, can see, you do have a thermal state. However, this is the case because it that would be analogous to tracing all degrees of freedom that are outside the right wedge. So in some sense, for the to get the Unruh state, you are essentially make, taking a partial trace of the quantum field where you're tracing out all degrees of freedom that are not in the right wedge. So the, in this case, we people, in this case, you are really uh, missing any phenomenos, any phenomenology that might happen outside. Now, when I say that I am ignore, I am neglecting the left wedge. I'm not tracing the left wedge out. I'm just choosing points that are not on the left wedge. So, any mm -hmm. anything that might happen in the left wedge that gives influence on the on the on the right wedge would still be captured by the calculations that we are doing. It's just that we're not considering points on the left wedge. It's okay. just that. Okay, okay, I see. So we, we, okay. we would be able to see influence, the inf if the left wedge has influence on the right wedge, we are able to see that. However, uh, phenomena happening on the left wedge, this is invisible to us because we are not putting any probes there. We are not putting any detector on the left wedge. However, influence it might have on the right wedge, it is there, it's being considered. And and can you quantify if the if the left wedge it's it's influencing something or it is possible? Have you seen something some some calculation on this like some kind of tunneling or? Not that I'm aware of, but it might be possible to do something uh, maybe analogous to the to the Unruh effect and try to mm -hmm. come up with a calculation where we trace out the degrees of freedom on the left wedge mm -hmm. and on the white hole region. With, uh, mm -hmm. and, and compare to see if we get the same mm -hmm. result. Yep. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if it's technically. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not aware that if someone has already done that, but mm -hmm. that would be something similar to what people have done to understand the Unru effect. Maybe this is possible to do. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So I just have to congratulate to you to like uh, keep going. Nice, nice, nice work in the PhD. Congratulations, Mark. Also. And um, yeah, so thanks very much. Thank you for your so, attention and for the observations. Yeah. So, Mark, you wanna say a few words or so? So, how this works, right? So, after this, uh, Mark and João have to leave, and I continue here with uh, um, Alessandro just to to like uh, thermalize between we two, and uh, you two get the answer by emails. So there's Can no coming back and anything. Right. Huh? No, I was making <laughs> yeah. a joke. Create a mix. <laughs> yeah, mix is <laughs> exactly. So, Mark, if you want to, uh, or João, if you want to say some words or otherwise. Hmm. Oh, just the last thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank, thanks, Fabri, for being here, for your attention. Thanks, Felipe, for the attention. Thanks, Mark, for advising me. Uh, Larissa, also for being here so early. It's BPF. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, also, I just wanted to thank both of, well, all of you, but particularly Sandra and, and Felipe for the theme part of the, part of the committee. Okay. Thanks to you for okay. the invitation. Então, so, so, Larissa, então, acho que agora fica só eu e o Alessandro, né? E você vai, vai, vai parar a transmissão, a gravação, não é isso?